Well, it is uh, good to be here. Suppose you all know about drug science. You know it's uh, a charity that was set up 13 years ago now to try to, try to provide the, uh, the, uh, the academic and the industrial and the public communities with the truth about drugs. Because, um, as you probably, some of you will know, the government wasn't doing a very good job and uh, we thought we could do a better one, and I'm sure there is no doubt that we have done that uh, in many areas of drugs and drug science. Uh, but today we're going to focus on, on cannabis and this project 2021. And I, I should say, I, I, today, the full paper that has just come out this, this morning, I didn't have a chance to slip it into the slides um, for various technical reasons. Uh, but on the Drug Science website, you will be able to find the full published data on all the um, outputs I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, so what is Project 2021? Well, it's the UK's was biggest national medical cannabis real world registry. It's a multi-stakeholder partnership and it con comprises quite a number of senior academics, uh, a number of industry partners, uh, up to about 80 clinicians, and of course, thousands of patients. And we set it up about three years ago because when the Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, said in November 2018 that, of course, cannabis was a medicine, uh, we, we all celebrated, but we suspected that there wouldn't be a great deal of follow-through, particularly when the uh, qualification was made to that announcement that it could only be prescribed by specialists. And I'm a specialist. I'm a specialist psychiatrist, and I'm pretty, uh, was pretty clear at the time that most specialists in all disciplines would not want to take on the challenge of something as innovative as medical cannabis. And as you know, it's been proved right, and there are only four prescriptions on the NHS in the last four years. And the government itself has been very mealy-mouthed about doing anything, pushing the buck to the ACMD, and the ACMD has uh, not really done anything itself. Uh, and we decided after a, a conference th uh, three years ago that we should do something. And um, he thought, that, well, the best thing we could do would be to try to gather some evidence. Now, you've already heard from the previous speakers that collecting evidence in the traditional form of RCTs requires enormous amounts of money. And that's why it's never happened. No, nowhere in the world really has anyone done a, a proper ECT, certainly a full extract cannabis products. So we started with audits of children with severe epilepsy who were benefiting from a medical cannabis. And then we went on to facilitate access of medical cannabis through this 2021 initiative. And, and what's unique about this initiative is that uh, the prescribing doctors nor the patients have any uh, control over the output. So we collate the outputs. That's the deal we give them in order to get the discounted price that the patients pay and the benefit that the prescribers have is to be uh, linked to this uh, impressive team of, of academics we put together. Almost all the data we collect is a self-report. Uh, so it's all patient-reported outcomes, which, as you've heard from the previous speaker, is something that is now being seen as not only important, but actually central to the development of new medicines in the UK. So we are, at the very least, uh, complying with the intentions and the ambitions of, of current bodies such as the MHRA and NICE. Um, and so here you can see on the slide the, the data we collect. And it's important to emphasize that everyone who comes into this uh, registry has got a GP in the UK, and they've all been tried on at least two medications for their disorder, which have not been satisfactory, not been adequate. So they're relatively treatment-resistant patients. And one of the clever things we did was to 
learn from what we'd already discovered, particularly talking to colleagues in Canada, that medical cannabis has broader effects than those that they might be the, might be the primary reason for use. So if someone may be using cannabis for pain, but often they report it has benefits in terms of mood and anxiety and sleep and quality of life. So we collect those data on everyone because it's an overarching set of information, which in the end is likely to provide or to prove as important in getting medical buy-in and, and regulatory buy-in as the specific data we collect on the particular disorders. Uh, and that is because it's very rare for someone to have a, a, disor a single disorder that doesn't impact on mood or sleep or quality of life. And, but we've also done parallel analyses, particularly in the pain sphere of medical cannabis, showing that quality of life is a, an important consideration that is almost always neglected by traditional studies that look simply at scales of pain. And of course, we also have disorder-specific measures, which you can see on the, the right-hand column here. So we have specific measures for pain and anxiety, PTSD for Tourette's, multiple sclerosis, substance use disorders, and epilepsy. So disorder-specific and overarching uh, essential quality of life measures. So the data is real world evidence. It's, uh, it's important, I think, to say a little bit more about this. Some of the previous speakers have touched on it, but I think they've perhaps not fully emphasized the fact that, that this is what real doctors in the real world want. We want to know if we take a patient who's got a disorder and we treat them with medical cannabis, what is the likelihood that they are going to get better? And we want to ask that of every patient, not just that very small percentage of patients who would meet primary criteria but be excluded from trials because they have secondary disorders. And 90% of all the patients in Project 2021 have secondary disorders. Most of them have more than five secondary disorders. They would almost all, therefore, be eliminated from conventional RCTs. And this is one of the weaknesses of RCTs. RCTs uh, have been, up till now, the standard for regulatory decision-making but they're definitely not the standard for clinical decision-making. And real-world evidence is supplanting RCTs, or certainly augmenting RCTs in that regard. And here you can also see the um, other things we do statistically to uh, impute data, to monitor things in longitudinally. And importantly, the data is owned by drug science, so we analyze it, we report it. Companies have access to it for safety reporting if they want, but they have no control over the output. So, these are the data I'm going to share with you today, published in the paper in, in the journal Drug Science Policy and Law this morning, and also available on the Drug Science website. So we've, um, by the 31st of January this year, we had 3,425 3, individuals 64% male, average age 40.8 years. And here you see the, the distribution of the age ranges. So uh, a lot of middle-aged people. And to our mind, that's really quite interesting. And it certainly conflicts with some of the other conversations you've heard this morning, where populations tend to be more female and older. And we think this is an interesting group we're studying because most of these people are working age. And one of the reasons people don't work is because they're suffering um, chronic illnesses which may be remediated by medical cannabis. And uh, that's the quality of life measures are very important proxies for the likelihood of them getting back to work. So 
this is a population that we really do want to improve quality of life in because they could then contribute to greater economic progress. So the primary conditions, and I'm sorry the uh, discrimination is not that great on here, but the largest half of the patients have chronic pain and 40%, 41% have psychiatric disorders, largely anxiety disorders, the bigger pinkish sector, and then the next sector is PTSD. And then about 6% have neurological disorders, like multiple sclerosis, Tourette's, etc. But that's still quite a large number. So we can get information even on relatively rare disorders like Tourette's. So I've touched on this, but uh, I'll just emphasize it again. So we measure at entry and then at three monthly intervals, alterations in their overall quality of life and the specific uh, measures relating to their particular disorder. We also measure me medication. We measure what they're in, when they're on, when they come in, and we measure what they're on every time we see them. And that's actually thrown up something really quite remarkable, which relates to the alterations in opioid use, which I'll touch on. And I should just emphasize, the drug, drug science doesn't do anything. We just monitor uh, the decisions as to what people are taking, what medications they're taking beyond medical cannabis is done by the patient or by the GP, or possibly by the, uh, in collaboration with the prescribing consultant. But we don't influence that in any way, we just monitor what happens. So general health, we're measuring it using this uh, EQ5D measure, which is generally uh, used throughout Europe. Um, so we've got data on 1,071 people. And the mean score at baseline is about 48. Now, optimal health is 100. So here we have people scoring less than 50% of the optimal. Uh, and at three months, that had gone from 48 to 59. So that's a big improvement in quality of life. And just using a simple T-test, that's a very highly significant. Now, T-tests aren't very uh, meaningful. Uh, we now, they tell you whether things are statistically different, but they don't really tell you whether they're clinically meaningfully different. And um, effect sizes are much better at doing that. And here you see the effect size, Cohen's D, of that general health measure of 0.53. And now that's a moderate effect size. Not many medicines in medicine have effect sizes of over 0.5. So we're very pleased with that. Here's the general health measure that I've just shown you again uh, with the the same data presented in a, in a row. But that's just to set you up for the other slides. So what we can now do is we can look at the overall sum of the different quality of life measures and then the individual measures. So here we have the overall sum. And there you see the effect size has now gone up to 0.66. And over, over, over about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 is a, is a big effect size. And I say very few, very few medicines ever achieve an effect size of over 0 0.7. So this is, again, rather compelling data. Mood. Now here, uh, the score goes down from 13.9 to 8.6, because this is the, the profile of mood scales, which is how depressed you are. And they start off pretty depressed. And the depression reduces very markedly. Uh, with it. So although most of them still score some measures of depression, they're not as depressed as they were before. And that change is easily as big as you get using an antidepressant to treat depression. And there's an effect size of 0.8. And the sleep quality. Again, this is the Pittsburgh scale, which is a scale where more is worse. So it's a scale of disrupted sleep. 
and you can see the baseline's 13, and three months has gone down to 10. Again, a very highly significant p-value and a big effect size. Way bigger than I'm sure any sleeping, sleep promoting medication has ever produced when used in this way. So these are truly remarkable findings in terms of the enormous benefits across a range of uh, psychological experiences in these patients. Now what about the disorder specific symptoms? So we, what we have here is we have data, three month data for 618 people with pain, 360 people with anxiety, 56 with PTSD. So with anxiety, we're using the GAD7 scale. And uh, this is a scale which goes down as you get better. And you can see the score almost halves. The first three months of being treated. Uh, and that is a huge effect. And you can see that because if you look at the effect size, it's 1.24. Now, these are ma that's massive. I doubt if any trial of anxiety has ever shown an effect size that big. With chronic pain, we've got uh, two measures. We've got the intensity of the pain and the interference with life. And uh, both of these go down, and both of these go down right about 0.65. So moderate to large effect sizes to reduce pain. And this really was actually um, very pleasing to us because we've been having arguments with pain doctors for the last four years over our interpretations of the value of quality of life as a measure, uh, a, an important outcome measure in terms of pain, uh, as a, particularly as an adjunct to not routine pain scores. And we're interesting to see, you may have seen yesterday, there was a paper published showing very similar effects for medical cannabis in a, by another group. So it looks fairly consistent now that you do get benefits of medical cannabis in pe on pain as well as on the other um, broader uh, profiles of improvement in terms of quality of life. PTSD. The scores go down from 62 to 50. Uh, again, very significant. And again, a moderate effect size. So very, very satisfying for patients and I'm sure for the doctors who are treating them. You have already worked out that there are differences between the um, changes in the different disorders. We've highlighted them here. And that the anxiety effect is bigger those people with anxiety disorders get stronger changes than those with, um, with either pain or PTSD. But they're all significant. And then we come to this interesting question of what happens to the use of other medication in the pain patients. And uh, as I said, we did not direct any alterations in the use of any other analgesics. But we monitored them, and what we did was collate all the different opioids that were being used, and we put them into this um, measure of medical morphine equivalents, MMEs. Quite a challenging thing to do, as you see from the, the top right-hand corner of that, uh, the bottom box, there are 18 misspellings of codeine in the data set we have. So it took a lot of cleaning, but it was done. And uh, so then we were able to look at how opioid use changed over the course of the three months treatment. So in those 350 chronic pain patients, the baseline levels of morphine equivalents were 44 milligrams, and by three months they were down to 19 milligrams. And again, that was a highly significant, P less than 001, change. And the effect size was also not bad, 0.32. Not as big as the other things, possibly because we weren't targeting it. Probably because there was a lot of variation 
in terms of the, um, the actual amount of morphine being used or morphine equivalents being used. But, but I want to emphasize, this, these are patients who are choosing not to use opiates because they don't need to. And you have to say, I think one of the speakers this morning said that the UK has the highest level of opiate use in the world, uh, or a Western world anyway, and um, although we're not killing off people with opiates in the same way as they are in America, it's always good to have less. And this is really very satisfying. And as I say, this is untargeted. It's almost certain you could do better if we made efforts uh, to, to encourage the reuse of, reduce of opiate painkillers. And that might be a, a subject for a proper controlled trial, but at present we don't have the resources to do that. Now what about adverse experiences? And this is a really important corollary to the clinical benefits. Are there going to be disbenefits? I remember going on to the, um, a morning breakfast show four years ago when medical cannabis was made legal, arguing with the chair of the, uh, of the British pain doctors. And he said he could not support medical cannabis for pain because everyone would go psychotic. Well, no one's gone psychotic. Uh, and we are monitoring <laughs> that. He also implied most people would get dependent, and we're using a new scale which has been developed by Professor Curran, who's one of our academic experts, and we're not finding any real evidence of dependence either. In fact, what we're finding in terms of adverse effects are what we know from people who use cannabis recreationally. They get dry mouth, they get drowsy, and they get red eyes. But these are very small numbers. So we've got 1,000 people and 15 complaining of a dry mouth, of which 10 of those, it was mild. So the tolerability profile is extraordinarily high. So two people with intrusive thoughts, maybe edging towards some kind of paranoid experience, you know, two out of a, over a thousand. So I just want to wind up now with a, a, some a, you know, brief conclusions. I mean, it is really extremely disappointing to people like me who spent my life in working in the NHS that the NHS isn't using medical cannabis as it could and should, uh, particularly when we see large numbers of patients who are having to spend vast amounts of money that they can't afford in order to keep their children alive from severe epilepsy, or to keep their pain at bay. And I think now we've, this, this is evidence enough to warrant proper systematic assessment within the NHS, because the evidence we've provided for tolerability and efficacy is unquestionably outstanding. And th there would be no downside to that provided the NHS was geared up to collect the data in the same way as we're collecting it. That shouldn't be difficult, should it? I mean, that's kind of what the NHS was supposed to be doing. In fact, we're selling the NHS to overseas investors because we can, we're, we're telling them we can give them not only clinical data, but we can also give them genetic data and, uh, and other measures. But um, I begin to wonder whether that's actually true, if we can't actually or orchestrate the NHS to, to allow medical cannabis prescribing in a way where we could collect the data uh, in the same way as we've collected it. And in fact, we've offered our database to the NHS. Uh, they've declined at present. They've, uh, they've said that they'll do their own. Um, they said that uh, three years ago when we first met with them, and they said that subsequently, but as you probably know, they haven't at all. And um, the NHS registry at present uh, doesn't contain any, not a single patient. So we have an absurd situation where we have a medicine which can be used by over 20,000 specialists in Britain, and it's not being used at all. Uh, and again, one of the earlier speakers today pointed out the 
idea that, or the, the, the initial release of medical cannabis through specialists was almost certainly a mistake. It could have been a deliberate ploy to avoid it actually getting used because, of course, most of the people that would benefit, certainly in our cohorts, could be seen in primary care. And uh, this is what I said on the... We have this truly absurd situation where the government has promised us that they will do trials on medical cannabis. They said they were going to do a trial in childhood epilepsy. The, on the day that the law was changed, I had a conversation with the Department of Health about this, and uh, they said it was going to happen. But it still hasn't, and it, it probably never will. And that's one reason why you know, it's important that groups like ours collect data on as many different disorders and many people who are getting medical cannabis as possible because in the end it may be this is the only data we will have. So uh, I'll finish. I just want to acknowledge the Scientific Advisory Board, which the list at the top there, they're uh, uh, an extremely impressive group of, uh, of committed clinicians and academics. The, the team at Drug Science, um, particularly David Badcock, who's uh, been uh, overseeing the, the charity for a long time. The companies that have supported us, uh, the, the cl clinics that have um, done the prescribing and the producers at the bottom as well, and of course the patient representatives, some of whom I see in the audience. So thanks to you all. And before I finish, I just want to mention that one of the other things drug science does is to support the UK Patient Conference on Medical Cannabis. And that is happening now on the 3rd of November. It's in the Conway Hall in North London, which is a wonderful venue. And uh, I look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you.